There are currently 28,300 satellites orbiting the Earth, each traveling somewhere between 7,000 and 28,800 kilometers per hour. It's difficult to get a perspective of how fast that is. Right now over your head, pretty much no matter where you are in the world, these 28,300 satellites are flying over you at eight kilometers per second. That's nearly 13 times the speed of a bullet, or about 23 times the speed of sound. Now imagine that two of these 28,300 satellites collide, shattering into millions of pieces of metal and debris, each traveling at tens of thousands of kilometers an hour. Now these pieces of debris fly off in all directions, colliding with other satellites, destroying them, and causing further debris to fly off in all directions, which destroys more satellites, so on and so forth, in an exponential curve of destruction until every single satellite has been destroyed and the Earth is completely surrounded in an impenetrable field of satellite shrapnel, making space travel and orbit impossible. This terrifying scenario is called Kessler Syndrome. But what are the chances of this actually happening? First proposed by NASA scientist Donald Kessler in 1978, this theoretical scenario warns that a single satellite collision could create a chain reaction of debris which covers the entire Earth. Now, if you're into sci-fi and you've clicked on this video, so there's a pretty good chance that you are, you've likely seen the movie Gravity, which is probably the most popular depiction of Kessler Syndrome as it serves the major plot point of the movie. Now, there are a bunch of scientific inaccuracies in the movie, but it is a really good movie nonetheless, and it does relatively accurately depict Kessler Syndrome. Now, to understand the gravity pun intended, of this problem, we need to delve a little deeper into the numbers. The probability of a satellite collision is calculated based on three factors. Firstly, the density of objects in a given orbital shell. Secondly, their relative velocities. And thirdly, the cross-sectional area of the satellites. Now, if you don't know what those are, that's okay. I'm gonna try and break it down in a simple form. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are currently around 28,300 satellites in orbit around the Earth. However, a large number of these aren't active. When you think of a satellite, you probably think of a little metal box with some solar panels and a communications dish, basically a little space computer. However, the fact is a satellite is simply any artificial object placed into orbit. And this includes space junk. Now us humans have been pretty casual about space junk in the 70-ish years we've been putting stuff into space. Space junk encompasses anything from spacecraft parts, whole used up upper stage rockets, dropped or lost equipment, and easily the biggest contributor, old, defunct, and no longer operational satellites. These are the metal cube space computery type ones I mentioned earlier. Now, not only does the latter make up the majority of space junk, but it also makes up the largest pieces of space junk, making it the most hazardous. Now, over the Earth, there are different orbital zones, sort of like how commercial airliners fly at different altitudes, only orbital zones are, let's say, very, very lightly regulated compared to commercial airliners. Orbital zones between 500 and 1200 kilometers tend to be the most congested and therefore at highest risk. Now NASA estimates that even a small fragment, just 10 centimeters wide, can destroy an operational satellite or puncture the hull of the ISS, or the International Space Station. Now for reference or scale, that's roughly half the size of one metric banana. Or if you're one of my American friends, about half the size of an imperial banana, about half that big could punch a hole in the ISS or completely destroy an operational satellite. Now, currently over 30,000 trackable objects larger than 10 centimeters are cataloged in Earth's orbit. However, it's estimated that millions of smaller untrackable pieces are also present, each capable of causing damage to objects in orbit. Now, Starlink, SpaceX's project to provide global internet, has drastically increased the number of large satellites in orbit since the first Starlink satellite deployment in 2018. Now, SpaceX plans to deploy over 42,000 satellites, which would obviously dramatically increase the number of total satellites in Earth orbit. On a good clear night without lots of light pollution, you can actually see Starlink satellites as well as many other satellites passing overhead. You do need to give your eyes a good five to 10 minutes to acclimate to a low light, but you can easily see them pass over with the naked eye. With all this satellite action going on in space, what's being done to mitigate these risks and prevent a Kessler syndrome type situation? Now NASA and the ESA, or the European Space Agency, and private companies like SpaceX do employ various strategies to manage orbital debris. Now mitigation begins with design. Modern day satellites are equipped with autonomous collision avoidance systems that track and respond to potential collision risk threats in their orbital path. Now Starlink, for instance, uses onboard AI to calculate and adjust orbits in real time 
drastically reducing the collision probability. Now, on top of that, deorbiting planes ensure that satellites are removed from orbit after their operational lifespan, typically burning up during atmospheric re-entry. Now, SpaceX in particular are very proactive with deorbiting their old, unused satellites. To date, they've deorbited 788 of their old or faulty satellites. And in 2024, they announced plans to deorbit another 100 of their older satellites after discovering an error that could cause potential failures. The key here is responsible management of orbital assets. Better to deorbit a functional satellite and let it burn up than have another piece of space junk floating around if something goes wrong. Now, international guidelines like the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, quite a mouthful, IADC is the acronym, much easier. Recommendations are also in place to limit space debris creation. These include standards for satellite end-of-life disposal and collision risk management. To address the issue of existing debris, various space agencies and private companies are developing active removal technologies. Now, some of these concepts include robotic arms, nets, and even lasers to deorbit dangerous objects. The ESA, or European Space Agency's Clear Space One mission, scheduled for launch later this decade, aims to be the first ever dedicated debris removal mission ever undertaken. Now, more will no doubt be done to recover and deorbit space junk, but this is an issue that will take time, easily decades. Vehicles like the Starship coming online could drastically reduce this significantly. SpaceX has already floated the idea of using Starship for large-scale ADR, or active debris removal missions. This would involve either capturing or towing large defunct satellites and other debris out of orbit. A Starship could potentially use robotic arms or specially designed nets to capture defunct satellites or deploy systems to bring them down to Earth's atmosphere for safe re-entry and burning up. So for now though, what is the actual likelihood of a large in-orbit collision resulting in a Kessler syndrome type situation? I'll save you the math, it's relatively low. While it's difficult to accurately calculate, NASA currently estimates an in-orbit collision resulting in Kessler syndrome at less than a 1% probability. Now, there are several factors that play into this, but there are a few easy to understand ones. Now, 28,300 satellites sounds like a huge number, but consider this. At any given time, there are approximately 10,000 commercial airliners in the air, yet mid-air collisions are extremely rare, around one in a few million. Now, given that airliners are in controlled flight in the air and space junk is very much not, we also need to consider the incredibly large area by which space junk and satellites exist. Now, I'm going to do a thought experiment to explain this. As mentioned before, the most densely populated orbital zones are between 500 and 1200 kilometers. So let's split the difference and use an orbit of say 850 kilometers altitude as an example to work from for this thought experiment. So imagine an invisible sphere covering the Earth at an altitude of 850 kilometers, in which all 28,300 satellites orbit. Again, 28,000 sounds like a huge number, but it depends on how large of an occupied area we're talking about. So the average radius of the Earth is 6,331 kilometers. So we add our 850 kilometers altitude to that, we use four pi r squared, we get an orbital surface area of 655 million square kilometers, or for our American friends, 253 million square miles. So that's our surface area that all of the 28,300 satellites are occupying, assuming they all occupy this one orbit. So let's take that 28,300 satellites and divide them by the area to see what chunk of space they each get on average we get an average of 23,144 square kilometers each. Now, if you're not a maths person, what this means is if every single one of the 28,300 satellites currently in space around the Earth orbited at the exact same altitude, they'd still be separated on average by roughly the same area as the state of New Hampshire. That's one satellite for every state of New Hampshire sized chunk of orbital area. Now this is a flawed analogy as very few satellites orbit around the poles, most are condensed around the middle three quarters of the Earth, and they're constantly moving, so they're never evenly spaced from each other. However, they are spaced widely in altitude from 160 to almost 36,000 kilometers altitude for satellites in geostationary orbit, so I think this more than makes up for it. Now many of these satellites are also comparatively very, very small. A Starlink V2 satellite with its solar array deployed is roughly 22 meters by 4 meters by 20 centimeters in size. So even if you were trying to hit one, this would be a tall ask. 
Now, rendezvous with the ISS, for instance, the International Space Station, for supply and crew spacecraft like a Soyuz and Crew Dragon, is an incredibly difficult task which requires insane levels of complex calculations done both on the ground and by the spacecraft itself during docking procedures. The point here is while there's a lot of satellites in space, space is big. The consequences of a large in-orbit collision would be dire, but it's extremely unlikely. I think a good way of thinking about it is like a large asteroid or comet strike on the Earth. You know, should we be doing things to try and prevent it and sort of look out for it? Yeah, definitely. But do I spend a lot of my day worrying about it? No, because by all the available evidence, it's just pretty unlikely. Anyway, that's mission success for me. If you think I missed something or got something wrong or have something you'd like to add, please let me know in the comments. If you liked or found this video interesting, help me out by giving me a subscription. It helps me out, but it also means you won't miss any of the new videos I have on the way. Thanks for watching. That's it for me, and I'll see you next time.